thank you all so much for being here today. Um, as Marcus mentioned, my name is Grant Jones, and I'm currently a sixth year clinical psychology PhD candidate at Harvard. And today I want to tell you all a little bit about my research, which relates to naturalistic psychedelic use in health and communities of color. And for those of you who aren't aware, aware naturalistic psychedelic use relates to psychedelic use in real world, non-clinical contexts. Before I jump into um, the content of my talk itself, I want to provide an overview of what I'm going to talk with you about today. I'm going to start with reviewing background information on psychedelics and health, as well as key gaps that I perceive within current psychedelic research. And then I'll discuss the role of naturalistic psychedelic research in filling those gaps. And then I'll then discuss my naturalistic psychedelic research, which also uh, I've conducted, um, as the title suggests, within communities of color. I'll then conclude by reviewing future directions for my research. So I know that most of you here are likely familiar with what psychedelics are, given that you're at a webinar for psychedelics. However, I always find it's helpful to ground in some basic terminology before uh, moving on to more complex topics. So that being said, psychedelics are substances that give rise to non-ordinary states of consciousness, characterized by profound changes in mood and perspective. And some substances that are included within this class, um, the class of psychedelics are uh, MDMA or ecstasy as it's known uh, within the States, which is an, uh, it's called an empathogen because of its um, propensity to give rise to feelings of increased social connectedness and increased emotional openness. And then also uh, other substances within um, the psychedelic class are psilocybin, LSD, peyote, which is a psychoactive cactus, and mescaline, which is the primary psychoactive compound within peyote. And these are classic psychedelics, which are naturally occurring or derived, and they give rise to uh, experiences of distortions of time and space. They can also give rise to mystical type experiences that um, have profound spiritual and personal significance. And as many of you may know, uh, psychedelics represent uh, novel treatments for many difficult to treat mental health conditions, as there have been a number of groundbreaking uh, foundational clinical trials that demonstrate the efficacy of psychedelics for a host of different mental health conditions. Uh, and again, just for some basic information, clinical trials, for those of you who might not be familiar, are trials in which people are randomly assigned to one condition or another. You get a treatment or you don't get the treatment. And this framework allows one to uh, compare the uh, efficacy um, of a given treatment and to assess it um, for a given mental health condition. So an example of a foundational psychedelic clinical trial is Mitchell et al. 2021, which was published in the prestigious journal Nature Medicine, demonstrating that MDMA-assisted therapy may represent a uh, breakthrough treatment for treatment-resistant PTSD. And also Davis et al. 2021, which was published in the prestigious journal JAMA Psychiatry, demonstrating that psilocybin-assisted therapy may be an effective treatment for uh, depression. However, despite uh, uh, these clinical trials that have largely shaped the field, um, there still remain some very key gaps within psychedelic research at present. Given that psychedelic clinical trials are very tightly controlled, they have very limited slash no ecological validity, which is the first gap. And ecological validity is another way of asking, uh, do findings generalize to the real world? Again, because uh, psychedelic trials are oftentimes um, very meticulously crafted um, with very uh, meticulously, meticulously selected samples um, and very tightly controlled um, substances within these contexts, it's not clear generally how psychedelic use is impacting mental well-being within real-world contexts. We still don't have very rigorous information about that. Second, uh, there's also very limited racial and ethnic diversity within psychedelic clinical trials, uh, meaning that we don't know about the impact of these substances on, um, on mental health within uh, diverse populations. For instance, a 2018 review of foundational psychedelic clinical trials, Michaels et al. 2018 found that samples are often greater than 80% white within these, uh, within these uh, studies and just 4% black or Hispanic. Um, which is, uh, for the U.S. context, very out of balance with what um, the actual population uh, balance and breakdown is. Taking this all together, we have very little information about the associations between psychedelic use and health, generally in a real-world context, but also specifically for diverse communities. However, this is where I believe that naturalistic psychedelic 
research has a role in filling such gaps. Again, just to reground us in some definition, naturalistic psychedelic research relates to studying psychedelic use in real world non-clinical contexts. And typically naturalistic psychedelic research is in the form of online surveys or large epidemiological surveys. Such studies can address limitations to ecological validity as they're inherently rooted within real world contexts. And also they can address limitations to diversity within psychedelic research as such studies can be specifically targeted to diverse populations. And large epidemiological surveys like the type that I name oftentimes have hundreds of thousands of individuals within them that are balanced based on the breakdown of the population, providing an opportunity to study uh, the associations between psychedelics and health within diverse groups. So now with that all being said, uh, now I'll get into my naturalistic psychedelic research, which I've also conducted within uh, communities of color, as I mentioned. I wanna start with providing background information on the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, or the NISDA for short, as this is a survey that I've used uh, within uh, most of my psychedelic research uh, thus far. This is an annual survey that collects information on substance use and health in a nationally representative sample of the United States. So the breakdown racially, ethnically, um, from an uh, income-based perspective is uh, meant to mirror the broader makeup of the US population. And every year it surveys roughly 50,000 Americans ages 12 years old and, up and above. Um, so again, very large survey and it's been going on since uh, I think maybe the 80s or the 70s. So really robust information there. It includes thousands of variables on substance use and health, including psychedelics, offering a really robust chance to study um, the impact of these uh, substances uh, on um, health outcomes. An important uh, caveat or just clarifying fact about the NISDA that I always like to lead with up front is that these data are cross-sectional, meaning that they're collected at a single point in time. This is in contrast to longitudinal studies in which you're following a single group uh, or a group of people and tracking, for instance, their health outcomes um, repeatedly over a long period of time. So every year the NISDA collects uh, data on a new sample, it's not following people over time. And the reason why this is important is because cross-sectional studies are very limited in terms of uh, the causal uh, claims that you can make about them. So in the research that I'm going to discuss, for instance, I can't say that psychedelics are causing any changes in health or that psychedelics work differently in people of color. I can't claim that um, because of the cross-sectional nature of uh, this uh, data. Uh, the findings within a cross-sectional context are mostly correlational or associational. Um, so we see general trends, we, we will be able to see general trends within psychedelic use and health that future research, um, longitudinal research, for instance, or clinical trials, for instance, uh, would be able to further elucidate whether um, there's uh, causality uh, within the associations that we might observe within a cross-sectional context. So I always like to leave with that caveat uh, up front. So now with that all laid out, uh, I want to now jump into discussing my first research paper in this area, Jones and Nock 2022A. And the core research question that I had within this paper was the following. How is MDMA in class of psychedelic use associated at the population level with psychological distress and suicidality? Are we seeing that MDMA use is generally associated with higher levels, lower levels? Um, that's what the study sought out to test. In the study, I again used data from the NISDA um, from years 20, 2008, 2019, writing a very robust sample of 484,000 individuals. I included all adults ages 18 years and above within the study. The independent variables are the core uh, domains that I was changing um, or manipulating. So uh, was assessing lifetime use of the following substances, MDMA, and then also four individual classes of psychedelics, psilocybin, LSD, peyote, and masculine. And with these variables, um, these are binary variables. So essentially these variables are assessing whether one had or had not done any of these substances within um, their lives. The dependent variables were also binary um, and the dependent variables represent the core outcomes that I'm assessing. Uh, and these are four variables related to the following uh, health outcomes. Past month psychological distress, past year suicidal ideation, past year suicidal planning, and past year suicide attempt. 
And again, because these outcomes are binary, I'm assessing to see whether one did or did not um, meet a criteria for any one of these, uh, any one of these uh, conditions within the study. And within my analyses, I controlled for various demographic factors, such as age and sex, and also lifetime use of various substances like cocaine and pain relievers. And for those of you who may not be familiar, controlling for uh, variables is akin to uh, making sure that any associations that you find within uh, your study aren't uh, driven by any of these factors. So for instance, it's not the case that people of higher ages happen to do psychedelics more and that also is associated with them being more uh, suicidal, for instance. So is you're really trying to isolate and remove out any potential impact that these variables might have on your results when you control for them. For my analyses, I use something called logistic regression, which is specifically a modeling approach designed particularly for binary dependent variables like this hype within my study. And within a logistic regression framework, the core outcome is something called an odds ratio, which is the measure of the strength of an association between an independent variable and a binary dependent variable. If an odds ratio is lower than one, that means that the independent variable is associated with lowered odds of the dependent variable occurring. So for instance, in the study, let's say that I'm assessing, you know, MDMA as an independent variable and um, I want to assess this association on distress, for instance, or suicidality like we're doing here. If uh, lifetime MDMA use were then to have an odds ratio of 0 0.90 for past year suicidal thinking, that would mean that individuals who use, who have used MDMA within their lives have 0 0.9 times the odds or 10% lowered odds of having experienced suicidal thinking than those who have not used MDMA. And again, I always like to come back to this caveat that, that I'm not trying to claim that MDMA is causing reductions in suicidality at all. But you're just saying, again, at the population level, accounting for all these other factors, we're still seeing an association between MDMA um, and people who use it and them being um, on average less suicidal than those who don't use it. So now that we've laid out this framework, um, let's go ahead and get into the results to see what I actually found. The key finding here from this first study is that indeed lifetime MDMA and psilocybin use are associated with lowered odds of psychological distress and suicidality. Specifically, MDMA is associated with lowered odds of past year suicidal thinking with an odds ratio of 0.90. It's also associated with lowered odds of past year suicidal planning with an odds ratio of 0.88. Psilocybin was associated with lowered odds of past month psychological distress with an odds ratio of 0 0.78. It also was associated with lower odds of passive suicidal thinking with an odds ratio of 0 0.90. So again, all the odds ratios are below one, sometimes robustly so, such as the case of past month psychological distress and psilocybin, indicating that again, these substances confer lowered odds of these outcomes. Importantly also, all other substances either shared no associations or conferred increased odds of these outcomes. So every other substance, I included roughly 10 other substances within my models. None of them had this pattern of associations with distress and suicidality. So it's really showing that MDMA and psilocybin stand alone and are unique in terms of these protective associations um, and really demonstrates that there um, is something special happening with these substances. And again, don't know if it's causal, don't know if the people who use them are in some ways, um, you know, having better mental health profiles, can't tease this out from the study, but we are seeing that the pattern of results for these two substances stands alone compared to other substances. <clears throat> After this initial study, Jones and Knock 2022A, I subsequently replicated this pattern of results for numerous other outcomes. So for instance, I replicated this pattern of results for MDMA and psilocybin and major depressive episodes, demonstrating that MDMA and psilocybin confer lowered odds of major depressive episodes. I demonstrated this for psilocybin and crime arrests, which the, in these findings were a replication and extension of, of Hendricks et al. 2018, which demonstrated that classic psychedelic use is associated with lowered odds of crime arrests. I demonstrated this pattern for adolescent psilocybin use and suicidality, which is a replication of Hendricks et al. 2013, which found similar findings in adults and also Jones and Nock 2022A, which I just uh, described. I demonstrated this for psilocybin and opioid use disorder, which is a replication and extension of Pisano et al. 2017, which found um, uh, similar findings uh, to, to the ones that I um, illustrated. And I also found them for psilocybin and nicotine use disorder, 
and also for MDMA and impairments in social functioning. So this is a robust pattern within this data set, um, demonstrating consistently that psychedelics, particularly psilocybin and MDMA, as it stands out, um, oftentimes are associated with lowered odds of, uh, of these outcomes, of harmful mental health outcomes. So now that I've uh, replicated you know, these pattern of results, um, now that I had demonstrated um, that psilocybin and these psychedelics are associated with lowered odds of, of various uh, harmful mental health outcomes, the next thing that I wanted to do um, was subsequently explore how these associations might differ by race and ethnicity. And for those of you who are familiar uh, within the States, uh, racial, racial and ethnic minorities often exist in very different social milieus, different cultural contexts. They're also navigating um, unique challenges that, that are different from, from uh, white populations, such as racial discrimination, um, for instance, um, in work and, and in um, daily life. And so I um, wanted these analyses to be a first pass at understanding how might, you know, this blend of factors um, that we call race uh, be uh, impacting the associations between uh, psychedelics and health uh, within this data set. So with that all now being said, I'll now jump into what I did. So specifically, um, I conducted two studies thus far. Um, Jones and Nock 2022E and Jones 2023A, which explored whether race and ethnicity impact the associations between lifetime use of MDMA and psilocybin as the independent variables, and then also psychological distress, suicidality, and major depressive episodes as the dependent variables. And as um, you could probably tell, this is a very clear follow-up from my prior work. In the study, I used NISDA data, specifically within Jones and Nock 2022E, uh, which was focused on psychological distress and suicidality. Uh, I used this data from 2008 to 2019 with a sample of 484,000 individuals. For Jones 2023A, this paper was focused on major depressive episodes, specifically lifetime, past year, and past year severe major depressive episodes. And this um, sample was 596,000 individuals as I used this data from 2005 to 2019. And within these studies, I conducted moderation tests. And so my overall methodology was very similar to the methodology that I employed previously, where I used logistic regression models to assess the associations between psychedelics and various mental health outcomes. But the core difference here is that I use these moderation tests. And moderation, statistical moderation, is another way of asking, does the strength of the relationship between two variables, such as psilocybin as the independent variable and depression as the dependent variable, depend on the value of a third variable, such as race and ethnicity. And so put even more simply, does the association between psilocybin and depression change if you're of a different race or a different uh, ethnicity? So that's what I did. Now we can just jump straight away into some of the key findings from this work. The key findings at the statistical moderation tests were indeed significant, and that race and ethnicity impacts the aforementioned associations. But I also just didn't want to stop there. What I also wanted to do was to um, assess by subgroup how might the associations between um, psychedelics and health be different. So what are the unique specific relationships that psychedelics share with health for communities of color versus white populations? When I did this, I found very interesting findings. MDMA and psilocybin were associated with lowered odds of the aforementioned outcomes for white participants. However, there were fewer and weaker of such associations amongst participants of color. So for white participants, you're seeing findings that are in alignment with my prior work and also in alignment with the clinical literature. However, for participants of color, you're seeing a radically different set of results. And although these findings, as I said, are just cross-sectional, just correlational, the thing is they tee up very interesting questions about whether you'd see differential treatment effects within clinical settings. If you recall, clinical trials thus far have been very racially homogenous, so we can't say. But this is some of the first research that can tee up that it's possible that we might be seeing different treatment effects. Again, can't claim that from this, but my future, this work tees up those future studies. There's a few limitations to this work that I think are important to state very clearly. The NISDA features a seven level race and ethnicity variable. So non-Hispanic white, black, Asian, multiracial, Native American slash Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian slash Pacific Islander, and Hispanic. These categories are very limited slash flawed, and there's much more comprehensive ways to work with and assess race and ethnicity uh, within, uh, 
within this study and within other studies and other uh, uh, researchers use much more comprehensive ways of assessing race and ethnicity. However, this is the variable that exists within um, the NISDA data set, so this is what we had to work with. Also, the second limitation that I've mentioned a few times that I always want to come back to is that they, the data are cross-sectional, so therefore I cannot make any causal uh, claims from uh, this work. However, these limitations now point me to the future of what I want to do going forward. So let's discuss my future directions and prepare to conclude. So based on this work, there's a number of future directions that I'm very excited to take with this work. First, I want to conduct additional cross-sectional studies of psychedelic use in communities of color. As I saw, as you all saw on the prior slide, I've already conducted a number of studies just demonstrating that psychedelic use is associated with lowered odds of various mental health outcomes, but I have not conducted moderation tests for all of those studies. So I want to see, uh, would some of these moderation tests also be significant for some of those associations as well? I want to conduct longitudinal studies to see um, how psychedelics change health over time and how those changes over time might be different for different races or ethnicities, which can actually start to generate causal information about the impact of psychedelic use on health in real world contexts. I want to conduct qualitative studies to better understand the lived experiences of individuals of color who are using psychedelics in the real world. I also want to conduct investigations of set and setting for communities of color who use psychedelics. And for those of you who aren't familiar, set and setting re refers to the fact that the mindset that one heads into a psychedelic experience with, as well as the setting within which one does psychedelics, can radically change the impact and the nature of the psychedelic experience for uh, diverse groups. Um, and as I mentioned, populations of color um, are navigating radically different social milieus um, and tending to with discrimination and just different life experiences. And so um, for me, I'm curious how um, these experiences and how these contextual factors might play into the impacts that psychedelics have on uh, health within the real world. And finally, um, I'm very interested in one day conducting psychedelic assisted therapy for diverse communities. Uh, as mentioned, um, there uh, is immense promise with psychedelics for helping with a variety of mental health conditions. But it's also known that these substances are very context and treatment dependent, context dependent. Um, and so given that they're uh, so dependent on context, so dependent on background, for me, it feels imperative to design safe and effective uh, treatment paradigms for diverse groups so that this psychedelic renaissance in which psychedelics are rapidly taking off in terms of their prominence within popular culture and within research, so that this renaissance can be of maximum benefit and of minimal harm for all peoples. Thank you so much, and I look forward to uh, fielding any questions that you have about my work. Excellent. Many thanks, Grant, for the, for the, for, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, just for, for, for people who are not necessarily familiar with all the all the manuscripts and articles that you have written. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, there's a bunch of analysis and 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 data and uh, and and stuff that uh, Grant presented in a in a really succinct <laughs> way. So so he he covered a lot of ground uh, that he has done uh, a lot of empirical studies uh, with the NISDA data set. So so that's that's uh, that's wonderful. So thank you for for that. Uh, just as a reminder for for all the participants, you can you can start to uh, think about your your questions uh, for Grant, and uh, and you can write them in the in the Q and A section, and, uh, and then you can either uh, ask the question uh, yourself, so written out loud, or if you don't want to ask the question yourself you can leave the, the question anonymously or, or then you can mention in the in the question that uh, you don't want to you prefer not to read uh, ask it yourself so so i can i can do that uh, as as well but before we go to the q a session I'll, I'll just offer some some brief remarks and and thoughts that i i had when i i read grant's uh studies or at least some of them i can't claim that i i would have quite uh, had re uh, have read all of them but uh, at least some of some of those so my my background is in in psychology but also in in epidemiology and uh, these kind of uh, topics uh, related to 
main effects and then different sorts of subgroup differences are are a kind of a general topic uh, in in different kinds of uh, contexts and and variables and and outcomes or diseases or, or health outcomes and 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 so on and usually uh, there, there, there's kind of a difference maybe in 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 the way people of different disciplines approach these subgroup differences so usually psychologists are expecting subgroup differences on on the basis of of kind of a content and context and uh, and theoretical arguments and and so on whereas epidemiologists and public health researchers are usually more on the kind of bearing on the side of like main effects and they are they are sort of almost hoping that there wouldn't be any subgroup differences because they make the the interpretation of the of the results likely uh, more difficult so if you observe one association yeah it, it holds in different ethnic groups in, in men and women people with different levels of education and so on you're like yeah, we, are, we are we are all still on the main effect and 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 uh, none of the complicating moderation effects and 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 so on and if you do observe these moderation effects or subgroup differences in in the association then you kind of have to provide some sort of explanations and, and hypotheses on why why that might might be and and first i was i was reminded by the uh, by by one of the one of the quite recent studies i was done a couple of years ago not related to psychedelics in any way or shape or form but it was a study on on sugary beverages consumption and mortality and and what they found in in this study was that uh, the consumption of sugary beverages so uh, fruit juices and and, and lemonade and, and so on were associated with with higher all cause mortality then they went to study that in a, in a subgroup analysis one and what they found was that this well it, it was kind of a simplified subgroup analysis but anyway what they found was that uh, the the consumption of sugary beverages was related to higher mortality uh, among blacks, but not whites, among men, but not women, among those with less than high school education compared to, but not in, in those with a college degree or more, and among those with uh, uh, overweight, but not among those with, with normal weight. So these are sort of like, Raised raised a question when I was reading this that wait a minute this this seems to be that the the, the pattern seems to be that the, those with more of the more of uh, health risks uh, uh, for for those individuals or subgroups the the consumption of sugary beverages seems to be related to higher mortality risk but not among maybe those who are more protected overall in their social resources and 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 so on. So, so you could interpret this in various ways, but uh, if the association was sort of causal in in a kind of a simplified way, you would sort of probably expect that the association would, would be quite the same in in different in these different different groups. But that was not the, not the case, which kind of probably raises the possibility that maybe. The, the consumption of sugary beverages in these different groups kind of indicates something different uh, for some of these different uh, subgroups. And then if we go to the topic of psychedelics, as Grant mentioned, the, the, the kind of the main main suspects here are the, are the, are the setting or set and setting. And then there some people have also suggested some some theories that may, there might be some physiology differences or whatnot. There's no empirical evidence for that, but that could be a, a possibility. Uh, so, for instance, for for uh, the, the consumption of alcohol, we know that uh, some of the uh, Asian people are, are they don't have the genetic they, they their genetic tendencies are sort of. Uh, Protecting them from alcohol consumption because they they can't uh, burn the uh, burn alcohol in the same way as as, as some some uh, other subgroups. So 
I, I, the, the, these are the, the thing kind of things that Grant mentioned uh, for in the future direction themes that uh, might give some, give us some hints that whether the kind of use usage context context or the the ways uh, different subgroups might use psychedelics might sort of help to explain why uh, uh, why the the associations are are, are different. And I, I actually tried to find just any available evidence on, on this. So, so whether there, there might be any any studies that would have looked at kind of the set or setting differences for different ethnic subgroups, but I wasn't quite able to find any. So I'm 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 interested in hearing Grant's uh, ideas about this. So, so the only uh, study that I found was the is one study driving while under the influence of hallucinogens uh, or risk profiles, and uh, and this study found that among the people who reported using, uh, I think, well, it was hallucinogens in, in general. Uh, there were some differences in the in the uh, risk of driving while under the influence. But that, this was the only kind of the set or setting kind of a, a study that I, I found. So, so this seems to be quite an important theme for, for understanding the mechanisms of, of, of this, uh, of the subgroup differences. And then uh, actually Grant mentioned also the kind of the psychedelic, uh, assisted psychotherapy approach, the treatment approach, whether it could be applied, uh, or whether they there needs to be some uh, kind of a more nuanced approaches to that, taking into account the cultural or, or, or different background variables of, of various subgroups. And uh, I encountered this one study that looked at perceptions of uh, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, and they reported the differences in uh, among Black Americans compared to uh, the white Americans in their attitudes towards psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. So this was a data collected by uh, Amazon's Mechanical Turk. So not a nationally representative sample, but anyway, the, the, the finding was sort of a interesting one where they provided this sort of psychoeducation about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy for the participants. And, and then they looked at how, how different groups uh, kind of reacted, how positively they reacted to the idea of, of using psychedelic assisted uh, psychotherapy when what they found was uh, that the black participants uh, reacted more positively to the idea of, of psychedelic assisted uh, psychotherapy in, in this study uh, compared to the, 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 the white participants. So, so there's clearly kind of like many uh, Different different kinds of mechanisms probably going on that might explain the kind of the use usage uh, among the general population compared to uh, these kind of uh, people's attitudes towards uh, the uh, t uh, treatment uh, opportunities. So, just to uh, uh, as, a, as a final final uh, comment, I, I, here are some of the results uh, from Grant's uh, uh, analysis. There were some some uh, differences between uh, white uh, black participants, uh, and not not all of them were that that big uh, or large differences. But then there were also some some kind kind of a surprising effects that, uh, for instance. Uh, for for some of the associations were really protective for Asian people and uh, and multiracial uh, individuals. So so there there seems to be quite a variance uh, in in uh, also that some subgroups seem to kind of benefit even more uh, than um, than than the white participants. So so there's a there's a lot lot to unpack in in all of these these tables. I I'd I'd have to say. Uh, yeah, so, so these were my, my thoughts on, on Grant's, uh, 
this this line of research just to scratch the sort of the surface of of of, of these uh, topics that that I I thought about when when reading Grant's uh, great studies on on these these um, associations between the naturalistic use and uh, and different mental health outcomes. So thanks for for uh for the presentation if you have any any ideas that you uh, uh about my my comments at, at this point feel free to to comment or respond yeah thank you so much for um for that uh reflection those reflections of my work it's i'm very clear that you uh you know played very close attention i'm just touched by by the care that you took in, in, in looking. Um, um, yeah, I think you summed everything up um, quite nicely. I think um, something that um, I, you know, was hoping to touch on the question and answer, but you teed up is that there's a lot of diversity within these findings. And although kind of a, 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 for a, in broad strokes, um, we're seeing a few and weaker associations for um, populations of color. We're also seeing diversity and we're also seeing um, promise and potential as well. So, um, uh, as I mentioned, you know, my work is not supposed to tee up or make any de decisive claims about um, how psychedelics are impacting health in diverse communities, but it is um, just to start to illuminate the ground truth and the what we can very clearly see here that things are definitely different um, and we have to kind of understand more about why. So, um, so thank you again for your summary and definitely willing to take any questions that folks have. Excellent, thank you. So we already have one question uh, anonymous question about are there longitudinal population studies in the US that could be utilized as materials to examine possible causalities instead of just correlations related to psychedelic use? Yeah, it's a great question. And some work that I'm working on right now, I'm working with some collaborators who are part of a nonprofit um, that has been collecting information on um, uh, naturalistic use of psilocybin um, over time within. Um, within a pretty large sample. Um, it's not specifically nationally representative, but it's a longitudinal sample. So it's directly my way of following up on this research. So you can stay tuned for, um, stay tuned for um, hopefully, you know, um, we're still, you know, writing and preparing everything, but um, that manuscript should hopefully be finished and under submission soon. So hoping um, to move that forward. Um, and that's, uh, that's one that's one follow up that that is definitely here so great great to hear yeah uh, then another question do you have personality uh, do you have personal hypotheses on the possible uh causes for the ethnicity related differences so what would be your your sort of guess for sure um and for me um kind of as i teed up in the future directions I think a lot of it comes down to set and setting. Um, whereas again, just to remind folks, um, the mindset that somebody has into a psychedelic experience with, as well as the setting within which one does psychedelics can have a radical impact on the nature of the quality of the psychedelic experience. And I imagine uh, that different racial and ethnic groups are doing psychedelics in very different ways. Um, we don't, again, have information on that yet and we don't know why or how, but um, it is the case that um, cultures over time have used psychedelics in various different types of ceremonies and there various different ways for, um, for prayer, for sacrament. Um, and we don't have, you know, clear information on all the different subcultures, um, of psychedelic use that exist at present. And so getting more understanding about motivations for use in diverse communities can, can, um, can definitely elucidate that. And then also, unfortunately, a second thing as well as it relates to set and setting is that in the U.S. context, um, there's just much higher um, penalties uh, for um, folks of color who engage in illegal substance use than, than there are for white populations. And um, given that these substances are still illegal, um, folks of color have radically different associations and considerations when getting ready to head into a psychedelic experience that people who are white don't have. And so that can also be another um, core piece of information that that might be sh making um, the experiences uh, differ. Yeah, that, that was actually one of the reasons why, why I was so surprised by the the result uh, that I, I mentioned about the people's reactions 
towards psychedelic assisted psychotherapy that for the black participants that it was even they were even slightly more positive given that the kind of the, the overall drug policy and, uh, and, and and policing tends to be much worse for for ethnic minorities so so they they might be way more careful about all these substances in in terms of of, of the, their use sure uh, so so that was sort of a surprising surprising direction of the association. Yeah, I I agree also because I've also seen that paper. But I also think a lot of it, um, and I think maybe I, if I'm recalling this paper correctly, I think a lot of it also probably comes down to education as well. I mean, I think that um, clarifying the potential for these substances, what are the potential risks, what are the potential benefits, um, and laying out cl- clearly laying out what psychedelic assisted therapy can do and what it's like, I think could do a lot of breaking down fear and breaking down stigma, um, you know, on the population of color side. And then obviously, you know, on the structural side, I think also the more that we can move towards um, uh, non-racialized drug policies that disproportionately harm some communities versus others, I think that will also do a lot to to further um, further, uh, uh, break down barriers as well. So would would you consider some some other subgroups uh, that might be kind of, Function in a similar fashion as as the ethnicity subgroup differences. So, so do you think socioeconomic status or um, education, income, or place of residence or something like that? Do you do you think that they they would they might have similar moderation effects, or, or do you think the ethnicity has something uh, kind of uh, quite specific? Yeah, no, it's a it's a it's a great. Um... It's a great uh, question. I definitely think so. Um, I think, again, we've only started to scratch the surface about the ways in which contexts might be shaping um, psychedelic experiences um, and shaping uh, the ways in which psychedelics may be impacting health. I think that uh, for specifically, let's you know call up the idea of income as a potential moderator. I can definitely imagine ways in which um, folks who are... Um, Low income, for instance, might be using psychedelics um, uh, in very different incomes from people who are very different contexts rather than people who are um, high income. And also, I imagine that uh, when you're lower income, there's stressors within your environment that even if you know you have a salutary psychedelic experience, there's uh, if you can't, don't have money to pay your rent, even if you have a really nice trip, just to begin be explicit about it, that might not necessarily lead you to, uh, you know, having your depression alleviated or having, you know, your mental health conditions um, uh, improve if structurally uh, you're still not able to tap into the benefits of um, of the psychedelic experience. And so I, I, I know I have, I have a, well, I, I don't know, I can't claim, but, but I, I know that what I what I can say that I know is that it's a very important research question um, to to tee up, and I can imagine that um, you'll see similar findings. And I think some people have already started to actually use the NISDA for um, for these types of um, for for um, other types of moderation analyses with psychedelics um, and and health outcomes as well. So people are asking these questions and finding similar things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it, yeah. it is really a shame that many many of the studies, uh, the data that have been collected, they they haven't haven't asked specifically the kind of why do people use how do people use they they mostly stay on the like have you used and has it caused harm and uh, do you have dependence right <laughs> so, right so exactly. which is and, <laughs> totally and the, the and the funny thing is I think this is also and and kind of. I think something that I realized that I'm interested in generally, even outside of psychedelics, is I think that substance use research generally is very limited in terms of how it looks at the impact of substance use on health, just at writ large. I, I think that there's so much diversity in why people use, how people use, what the harms are. And again, I, I'm what I'm not advocating is it should be a free for all. People should just be using these substances. Not at all. And in, in fact, and I and and I think something that we also need to assess within psychedelics is the ways in which psychedelics can cause harm, which I think, you know, we've kind of swung to all the way to the other end. But these substances are amazing. Yes, they are. But also, um, again, a part of the reason why I want to do this work is because I, I feel very confident that even though they're, you know, great tools, they can also cause a lot of harm if not done well. And so I, again, I think that these questions exist not only for psychedelics, but also for substance use generally. It's just really better understanding what goes into 
what's causing and what's impacting what makes something a positive substance use experience for one person versus not for another one and really getting clear about that so that we can have much clearer um harm reduction guidelines and um and uh and public health guidance for people who are choosing to use substances because people are going to use all sorts of substances and we it might as well be clear and uh, supportive as, as best we can um, with, with and for them. Yeah, 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 great, great, uh, great thoughts. Actually, the, the point about the next question uh, from the Q&A relates to some of the possible harms that mm -hmm. uh, w were observed in some of your studies there's a question of do you have any comment on the high value in table four so the lower uh no, that might pro probably be the table three below uh high value in table that marcus shared for indigenous people and simple assault uh that result seemed to stand out from the from the others oh sorry so there's the indigenous oh. people's mdma use being associated with higher uh depression and then uh yeah there's a simple assault that's not statistically significant but still an elevated uh risk so so there's some uh evidence maybe for indigenous people there uh, so psychedelic use for, for uh, among them might even be sort of associated with higher risk do you have any any thoughts about that yeah, um, we'll definitely want to just yeah highlight that the um, the finding the simple assault finding the p value is above 0 0.05, meaning that that finding is not significant. So I always just want to um, you know just be clear about what what I did and did not find. But um, yeah. as it relates to um, the other finding, as it relates to increased odds of um, indigenous folks and um, increased odds of um, of uh, a major depressive order disorder as it relates to MDMA and ecstasy use. This again tees up questions about what's happening with um, indigenous um, in indigenous populations as it relates to MDMA use that might be um, leading people to be of increased risk. I I, I can't um, say because I, because again I, I what I don't have is experience about the lived experiences of individuals who are indigenous who are using MDMA why they're using MDMA in what contexts. How is it differed maybe from some more traditional uses of plant-based medicines within indigenous communities? I, I don't have any information about that. And I like to be very open that I don't. And that for me feels something that um, I feel increasing amounts of comfort about. And I also want to use these findings to be teeing up um, future research that can investigate um, these questions um, in a more rigorous way. Because again, cross-sectional information is very important, very helpful for these initial um, these initial first passes. Um, but they can't be used for anything decisive and definitive, which is why I like to state that over and over again. And so, um, don't like to claim that as anything, but more so to tee up future work within this area. Yeah, yeah, great. Uh, actually, there's a question somewhat related, maybe to to that point. Uh, if I remember, the, the, the question is, if I remember correctly, ayahuasca was missing from the psychedelic list that was presented at the beginning. Uh, are they not included in the, in the study uh, for, for some reasons? So, so does the NISTA, do they have ayahuasca on their list of psychedelics? Ayahuasca specifically, they don't as a variable. I'm almost yes. certain. They have, yeah. they have yeah. DMT, they have a mix between like, um, D DMT and FOXY, and I'm less familiar with FOXY, but they have a joint variable for that, is, is, is if I'm recalling correctly. But they don't have ayahuasca specifically as as a, as a um, as a psychedelic within the NISA. And so I focused my um, analyses on the four most commonly used substances, which are psilocybin, LSD, peyote, and mescaline. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. So next we have a question from Ruth. Please. Uh, let's see. Have I uh, now? Uh, I'm, I'm now on the speaker. Yes, you Can are. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a psychologist and a psychotherapist. So, I am interested in, interested in hearing your recommendations of, about how we can already uh incorporate some of these results in the in the clinical field what would you yeah. uh, advise uh for us clinicians 
Yeah, thanks so much for the question. I think I there's a few pieces of advice that I would have. Is number one, just start asking. I mean, if if it's relevant within the treatment setting, on a basic level, I would say you could actually just start asking your patients about um, what experiences they have with psychedelics, or if they bring them up, asking what the, what psychedelics have done for them, how has their life experience informed their psychedelic experiences. Um, I would say I think sometimes we forget, and they say this for research for clinicians as well, just a kind of some very, very basic question asking can go a long way in generating really critical insights that people might not have had because to tee up a good research question, it really starts from, oftentimes starts from personal experience, starts from just asking somebody, what is your lived experience like? So I would say just starting there and, and, um, and in a systematic way for any patients for whom it's relevant, asking them, um, again, when appropriate without, you know, obviously violating any boundaries or um, prying into areas that they don't want to go. Just asking them what their experiences have been, have been like. And then if, you know, there's enough patients for whom that's relevant over time, uh, and you start to see trends, and I don't know if you're kind of connected with any researchers um, or, you know, connected with the research uh, university. But again, very simple studies at this point would go a long way. Um, I think when I started doing these NISDA analyses, there were far fewer of them. Now there's a lot more. So, um, but I, when when some of these analyses are actually quite simple, and I and I just bring that up just to say that even still, there's still whole domains of, of, um, of, uh, of, the, of the association and the investigation into psychedelics and health that haven't been explored. So let's say, for instance, that you have a few patients and you know, or you, let's say you even have one patient, you have one or two, um, conducting a study with them just by asking them an interview, getting an experience of their, of their lived experience, how did psychedelics you shape their, shape their life experience if they're from a different background? That is a study, um, um, even if it's a very small sample that could go a long way in contributing to the psychedelic field, because again, we don't have some of this lived experience information about how psychedelics are um, impacting health for people. So uh, those would be two recommendations that I have. And then finally, um, again, I, I'm not really sure how um, funding uh, works in in um, in Finland for for science, but you know, um, kind of the third kind of step, I think, in all of this is, you know, after you first just start by asking some basic questions is the first step. Second, um, uh, maybe, you know, partnering with researchers to start to ask some of these questions in a very simple but systematic way, then maybe use some of those preliminary findings to get resources to ask more in-depth questions about um, the ways in which um, psychedelics uh, are impacting health within the clinic or within folks who are also in psychotherapy. And that can be, um, you know, go a long way in uh, generating really critical information about psychedelics and health in clinical settings. Thank you so much. I think that's great. That is a yes, great, great set of of ideas there. Um, Thank you. I don't know, how, yeah, how familiar you are with the with the uh, legal frame that we have here, but I mean, it, it is it's very strict uh, on on drug use. So also for us clinicians, we are in a difficult place. That mm. um, so we receive a lot of information, of course, like confidential information uh, in the therapy process, but then. Um, especially for those clients that are getting uh, help to go to therapy from the state, then we are at a difficult place about how much we have to uh, report of, uh, of, what, of, mm. of our work. But oh, uh, yeah. like co co collaborating yeah, with, with uh, like research institutions, I think that would be really great. Yeah, well, that's a really interesting point. And thank you so much for raising that up. I wasn't kind of aware. And I think similar in the U.S., although I don't think people, clinicians don't have to report drug use per se. But yeah, I mean, kind of something implicit in what you're sharing is definitely making sure that folks feel as safe as possible and that you have all safety protections in place so, so that people can speak openly to you, which I know is also a barrier to assessing um, substance use within the United States context as well as that people don't want to disclose because of fear of retribution from law enforcement. So any ways that you can make uh, it as, as safe as possible so that when people are trusting you that they're okay, I would, I would definitely strongly recommend. Thank you. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I think we can take one more question quickly. Uh, so, so there's a question about actually a polydrug topic so so the question is uh if i've understood correctly population studies on psychedelics have controlled the use of other drugs so how does this influence the generalizability of the results so so people are using 
many people are using different drugs uh, not at the same time, but uh, different points in, in their lives. So, so what do you think about the, the ability of these studies to sort of tease out the, the different effects of, of di- different drugs? Gotcha. So let me just read the question just to make sure I'm oriented, because um, I heard yours, yeah. but I just want to make sure I also don't miss anything from it. Okay. Um, so in terms of this impact on generalizability, I don't think that it limits generalizability at all. And I think that that's, for me, just a statistical question, um, because in controlling for, uh, in statistically controlling for um, the use of other substances, it's not, um, elim- it's, it's not eliminating that information from the model. It's just saying accounting for any substances that anybody else might have used. What is the specific isolated effect? Um, or I'm going to back up because that's causal language. What is the specific association between this substance and this health outcome? So I don't think it eliminates generalizability. Um, and I think generalizability much more so relates to your sample and to um, who's included in the study that lets you um, – extrapolate about the population at large. And again, because uh, the study, the sample that I used includes a national representative sample of the United States, it actually, in fact, is kind of one of the more generalizable studies that can that can exist within this domain. I think that generalizability is not an issue with statistical controlling. It's much more so, for instance, if I just had a sample that was, um, you know, 100% um, uh, white or 100% black, for instance, then I could not generalize those results to another population. But because these studies are inherently diverse, um, generalizability, I do not believe is affected. Okay, yeah, great. Thank you. So I, I think our time is unfortunately up. Uh, but I want to thank Grant for, for joining the webinar and uh, giving us uh, the uh, uh, a glimpse of his his research and uh, and the presentation. So this was really really interesting and uh, and a topic that's not covered uh, in in the Finnish context, uh, even even to the degree that uh, uh, covered in in the in the US or other other countries. So so this was really really uh, valuable for for us to hear about. So thank you. Uh, yeah, for 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 all the participants, if you're you're not yet uh, a member of uh, of Chutu, please consider joining. Uh, the, the, uh, and and also the next seminar uh, webinar will be uh, by Jules Evans on the 29th of of April. So you can you can write that uh, in in your calendar as as well. And uh, is there something something that you would like to say grant uh at the at the end or just thank you so much it was a pleasure to talk with you all about my work and i look forward to other opportunities to connect in the future thank you so much yeah thank you grant it was it was wonderful and and thank you for for all the participants for for joining and and asking the the uh, good questions thank you all have a great evening